everyone and thank you for joining in for today's uh, uh, online teaching session, the weekly teaching sessions we have been having for almost now seven to eight months now. Um, so a uh, uh, couple of announcements, basically, you know, I think uh, people have been uh, giving feedback that there are too many sessions now. I think every week is a little difficult. So we from 2021 will probably make it once in two weeks to make it a little more convenient for the faculty as well as for the, for the students. Um, for the timing, uh, also there is some uh, some feedback that you know shall we change the timing or keep it same pros and cons of both so we'll send a feedback to everyone uh for their comments and uh, whatever the majority kind of decides then we'll go with that so uh, that was about the future sessions now for today you know um thank you very much uh rajivadi cancer institute as well as uh, dr sandeep jain for um uh, for holding today's uh, uh, session which is going to be on a very very interesting uh, multi-display topic, uh, which is uh, with germ cell tumors. And thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for uh, first accepting to uh, moderate today's session. And also, thanks for getting uh, probably the best um, in the field, the best faculty and experts to share their views on um, on the on this very important subject and important topic. So I, I'll take uh, you know immense pleasure in introducing the faculty for today. Um, Dr. Sandeep is going to be men, you know, uh, moderating today's session, and we know he's a senior consultant in pediatric hematology oncology at um, Raji Gandhi Cancer Institute in, in Delhi. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Gauri Kapoor. She does an introduction to us, uh, past president of the PHO chapter, uh, and she's the medical director and head of pediatric hematology oncology at Raji Gandhi Cancer Institute Delhi. Um, Dr. Sajid Qureshi again does an introduction to this uh, audience. We have heard sir in multiple occasions and multiple times. Uh, he's a professor of and head of pediatric uh, um, onco surgery at the Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai. And uh, Dr. Shalini Mishra, senior consultant of uh, uh, pediatric uh, surgical oncology at the Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute. We also have Dr. Payal, who is a consultant uh, pediatric hematology oncology at Rajiv Gandhi, and she's going to, I think, help uh, Dr. Sandeep to uh, uh, to moderate today's session. So over to you, Dr. Sandeep, for the next one, one and a half hour. I think there'll be no didactic today, and Sandeep has put all in the case-based uh, discussions, and probably, you know, we can have more interactive sessions uh, via the case discussions. As usual, please keep your videos on, uh, put questions in the chat box, or raise your hand that will unmute you so that you can ask your question. Um, over to you, Dr. Sandeep. Thank you, Sunil. And uh, at the outset, I must appreciate effort of you and your team for holding this weekly session for DPHO fellows. And as you said, it has been now seven, eight months. And uh, thank you for kind introduction of our experts. And now we can start our today's session. And the topic assigned to us for today's discussion is diagnosis and staging of germ cell tumor. So we all know that germ cell tumor can be gonadal and extragonadal. So there are many features which are overlapping in the management of these tumors. And at the same time, there are many features which are unique to a particular patient depending on its site and also depending on the age of the patient. So we shall try to cover this important concept uh, through case-based discussion. And we have try we will try to cover a couple of cases of gonadal tumor and a couple more of uh, extra gonadal germ cell tumors. And before we start that, I would like to have a couple of slides on the uh, development perspective of germ cell tumor, which will be helpful for fellows to have the best basic understanding of germ cell tumor. So ma'am, shall we start? I think we should. Okay. Uh, so we know that uh, germ cell uh, tumors are derived from primordial germ cells. And actually, these are specified very early in the embryogenesis, and they move from embryo to gonadal ridge from second to sixth week of gestation. And during this migration, they undergo proliferation. And during this proliferation, they are vulnerable to genetic changes, and that may lead to formation of some abnormal tumor like teratoma and yolk sac tumor. And these are referred to as type 1 germ cell tumors. Now, because these germ cells have to migrate uh, from the embryo to the gonadal ridge, and they have to pass through yolk sac and also from the dorsal mesentery. So uh, during this period, this uh, tumor may occur in the extra gonadal sites like retroperitoneum or sacrococcus. So this is type 1 germ cell tumor, which occur early in the life, and extra gonadal are more common than the gonadal during this age group. Once uh, these uh, germ cells actually reach, uh, uh, reach the gonadal ridge, they undergo sex-specific differentiation, and 
during this sex specific differentiation this is tightly controlled by a series of cytokines and again there is a chances of genetic alteration during this period and which may lead to a formation of germ cell neoplasia in c2 which is a precursor lesion for germ cell tumor and later in the life it may develop into either seminoma or non seminomatous germ cell tumor so this is like type 2 uh, germ cell tumor which occurs either during puberty or in the early adulthood and they have a characteristic precursor malignant lesion which is called as gcnis germ cell neoplasia in c2 so uh, uh, again, uh, just uh, germ cell tumor are these are the tumors which are derived from primordial germ cells, which are destined to be either ova or sperm. They may be benign or malignant. They account for 3.5 percent of all childhood cancer, but in the young uh, adolescent and young adult, they may account for 14 percent of all malignancies. They are very heterogeneous in their clinical presentation, depending upon the site of the disease, age of the patient, and also pathological subtype. Uh, they also differ quite a bit uh, depending on the age of the patient. The molecular signature of type 1 germ cell tumor is quite different from type 2 germ cell tumor. Type 1 germ cell tumor is characterized by loss of 1P, 16Q and gain of 1Q, while type 2 germ cell tumor is characterized by amplification of isochromosome 12P. So the molecular signature of type 1 and type 2 is quite different and that we have learned in last one decade. So with this background, now we will try to cover uh, certain basic concept about the management of germ cell tumor, especially from the diagnosis and staging point of view. And uh, now may I request Dr. Varsha, who is fellow with us, and she will be presenting the first case. Uh, over to you, Varsha. Good afternoon, one and all. I'll be presenting the first case. A 17-year-old male child presented with right painless testicular swelling and abdominal swelling for last 20 days. There was history of loss of appetite and weight loss, and there was no history of any other constitutional symptoms. On anthropometric measurements, his height and weight were within 50th and 75th centile for his age and sex. His arm span was 176 centimeter, which was normal for his age. On further examination, his vitals were normal and there was no palpable lymphadenopathy, including supraclavicular or inguinal nodes. His standard stage was five. On examination, um, testicular examination revealed left testis, which was normal in size, shape, consistency, and had a smooth contour. And right testis was enlarged, measuring about five into four centimeter. And it was non-tender, firm in consistency. The overlying scrotal skin was free and Cuff impulse and transillumination test were negative. On systemic examination, on parabdominal examination, there was a firm mass in the right lumbar region measuring about seven into seven centimeter. It was irregular, non-tender, had a smooth surface and was non-balatable. No inguinal nodes were palpable. There was no organomegaly, hernial sites were free and rest systemic examination was normal. So uh, we did an ultrasound testis that revealed uh, the left testis, which was normal in size and had a normal eco-texture, uniform eco-texture, whereas right testis was enlarged and a middle and a lower pole was showing a complex solid cystic lesion with lobulated margin, measuring about 2.9 into 2.2 centimeter. So uh, we identified that the right testis has got a solid cystic isoechoic lesion. And we did a CT pelvis abdomen. This is axial section of the CT pelvis and abdomen showing a heterogeneously enhancing retroperitoneal mass measuring 8.7 into 3.7 into 2.1 centimeter, encasing the IVC and also compressing it. On blood investigations, the CBC, KFT, LFT was normal. That in among tumor markers, alpha fetoprotein was markedly raised, beta HCG was within normal limits, and serum LDH was borderline raised. Okay, uh, thank you, Varsha, for presenting this case. I think this is one of the classical presentation of testicular tumor. Now, uh, uh, ma'am, can uh, can you explain us what are the various clinical presentation of testicular tumor? Or, in other words, whenever some fellow is having a case in the exam, what all negative history he should take uh, while dealing with a child with testicular tumor? Ma'am, you have to unmute yourself. So the most common presentation 
development of testicular germ cell tumors is a painless enlargement, which is observed in about 60% of the patients. Uh, other symptoms usually are less frequent and not that characteristic. When we see a testicular mass and the first thing we want to know, is it a testicular or paratesticular? You know, is it coming from the testes or from the associated tissues? So painless enlargement testicular mass is the most common presentation. Other than that, there can be dull aching pain or acute abdomen due to torsion. If the disease is disseminated or spread to either the regional nodes or to distant nodes, one might find an abdominal mass. As we saw in this case, it had spread to the retroperitoneal nodes. One must examine other sites. The supraclavicular node of the left side is very important to be examined. If the disease is spread to the lungs, one could have cough or respiratory symptoms, but that would be in very advanced cases, which is not unusual in some of the patients who come to us. And finally, if there is a very large retroperitoneal mass, which is a nodal mass usually, then there may be edema of the extremity due to the IVC compression. So these are the most important things. We must not miss examination of abdomen, proper examination of the testes, both the testes, the other testes must be seen. And then, of course, the supraclavicular area and examination of other systems, especially the chest. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, sir, can you tell us uh, how do you clinically approach a child with testicular tumor and what are the possible differential diagnoses? So, for the clinical presentation, uh, as uh, Gauri Madam just rightly said, we just have to be certain that this is a testicular mass and not something else in the in the scrotum. There's something else in the scrotum in children uh, uh, could be a hernia, the commonest thing, or it could be an hydrocele, congenital hydrocele with only the scrotal component. And as uh, pointed out by uh, Madam, that uh, a differentiation between a paratesticular and a testicular primary is of uh, importance. Most of the general surgeon, most of the general surgeon, and I would say that pediatric surgeons also still don't have a concept of something in the in the testes which is firm in the scrotum which is firm has can be from tissues outside the testes, the paratesticular. I remember in my residency day, we had a child with this, and everyone gave hundreds of differential diagnoses except for a paratesticular abdomenosarcoma. So uh, the thing of uh, the disease from outside of the testes, but confined to the scrotum is possible in paratesticular RMS. As far as the examination is concerned, from the surgical and the diagnostic point, first we confirm the organ of origin. Then we uh, take an assessment about the surgical uh, thing. If it is, we are certain that this is a testicular tumor and surgery is planned. The thing is that is the thickening or is the nodularity extending uh, over or extending in the spermatic cord. So getting above the swelling, the famous thing in hernia examination and hydrocele examination, we say that can you get above the swelling? And if that you can get above the swelling, are the, scrotal uh, the spermatic cord structures felt, the vas felt? Is there any undue thickening in that mm -hmm. suggesting of extension of disease? in there and all examination for exclusion of hernia, which includes a cough on impulse, uh, examining the child on lying down position, gently compressing, is the swelling reducible? So all those examination things have to be con uh, confirmed. Testicular tumors, uh, if we have uh, shortlisted, they don't usually metastasize to the inguinal node. They don't usually, I said they uh, usually, I am not saying never. Testicular tumors can metastasize, metastasize to the inguinal lymph node. And that's a, a, a different uh, scenario when there is a, a scrotal violation and lymphatic uh, contamination. Only in that situation, you can get the inguinal lymph node. But it is a good point that we should examine the inguinal region and uh, obviously uh, we have to look in for the abdomen for uh, any lump in the abdomen which if it is a small lymph node in the retroperitoneum it is not palpable only if it is a larger node it the abdominal lump may be palpable and not to miss the supraclavicular lymph node so these are certain things we should not miss in uh, examination of a testicular tumor. 
Uh, thank you, sir. And from exam point of view, everyone should uh, note down the tenor and should see the signs of pub uh, precocious puberty or if there are any signs of gynecomastia and hirsutism, that should be mentioned. And even if they are not there, uh, one should negatively uh, mention them in their history and examination. The other, the one thing that I would like uh, to emphasize uh, is that whenever we are doing examination of these young adult or adolescent, we should try to maintain the privacy and we must take the consent from the parents or assent from the uh, <laughs> child because this is part of your examination and uh, examiner want to see that you have taken the permission from the uh, parents. Uh, thank you, sir. And now uh, let's move to the next question. And this is for Dr. Shalini. Dr. Shalini, we know that now we have a child who has a testicular tumor. We know that the first investigation that we do is ultrasound. But all inf uh, information we can get from the ultrasound. So the most important thing is it's, it's easily available in every center, even if it's a very small center. And uh, it will tell us a lot of information if it is done properly. And they, they, if they have a high frequency probe, they can even pick up uh, one to two millimeter intratesticular lesions. So anyways, this child has got a large enlarged testicular uh, mass, uh, which we have already palpated and it's not transluminant. So we know it's a solid lesion. So it will tell us whether there are cystic components or is it a uniform heterogeneous or homogeneous. And uh, also it will tell us about the contralateral testis. And uh, usually non-seminomatous germ cell tumors, they have a heterogeneous uh, appearance like we saw in this child's ultrasound with cystic and solid tumors. And some, maybe some calcifications also, which we can see. Uh, and Dr. Shalini, is, uh, it is not very uncommon to see microlithiasis in the contralateral testis when we do the ultrasound. Uh, so what is the significance of this? So if uh, uh, microlithiasis uh, is actually uh, defined as the presence of at least five, uh, five or more uh, echogenic uh, foci, which may be just tiny ones, like one or three millimeters, and it should be visible in the same cross section. So there is a strong association between microlithiasis and uh, testicular cancer, but in the absence of a testicular uh, mass as such, no, just because it's it's not a it's not like a precursor. So it's just because there is a microlithiasis that doesn't mean that this uh, patient, if we even if we screen, uh, we may not uh, come up with any uh, actual tumors. But yes, we should uh, make them aware about it and probably uh, self examination uh, recommended. Thank you. I think. Uh... This is a very important information and very often we see microlithiasis in the contralateral testes while doing ultrasound for the testicular mass. Uh, so uh, now uh, after ultrasound, I think the next investigation should be tumor markers. And uh, ma'am, can you tell us about the role of tumor marker in the uh, diagnosis of uh, germ cell tumor? Ma'am, you have to unmute yourself. Unlike many cancers, uh, germ cell tumor is one such where we have some biochemical tests in the blood, which can give us a very important clue. But the important thing is to do the test at the appropriate time when you suspect a certain germ cell tumor diagnosis. So the International Germ Cell Consensus Classification recommends all the three tests, the AFP, the beta-HCG, and the LDH to be done in the serum for all patients of testicular germ cell tumor. What are these? The uh, oncofetal substances are the AFP, which is produced from the trophoblastic cells, and the beta HCG from the sensation trophoblastic cells. While LDH, as you very well know, is a cellular enzyme. So, what is its significance? Uh, I'll just tell you in the next slide as well. But if we just look at it, we know that if AFP beta HCG is elevated, or especially if alpha fetoprotein is elevated, it's got a big yolk sac component and it is not a pure seminoma, right? So it helps us in, I will show, uh, can I have the next slide, Sandeep? Then we can come back to this slide. Yeah. Right, so what I want to tell you is that the AFP is elevated most commonly in the yolk sac tumor, but can also be elevated to some extent in the embryonal carcinoma, teratoma, and mixed germ cell tumors. But it is not raised in pure seminoma. It is not raised in pure Oreo carcinoma. 
also spurious elevation of AFP. AFP, as you know, is produced from the fetal yolk sac initially and then from the liver. So any liver damage, which could be due to cirrhosis, hepatitis, drugs, or even a tumor, hepatoblastoma, it will be elevated. But we have to have the clinical setting in which we interpret what the AFT means. One of the very important things to remember is that in the infants, the AFP is elevated. And if you see this chart over here, you will see that in, in newborns, it is as high as 48,000. The normal value is well less than 10 nanograms per ml, which is achieved by eight to 10 months of age. So when the baby is born, the level may be as high as 1 lakh, in premature, it may be as high as 1 lakh 34,000. And as the baby matures within a few months, usually eight to 10 months, it comes down to less than 10. And then of course it is, you can see here. So it is good that if you have a, an infant who is less than 12 months of age and has a high AFP before jumping to a diagnosis of a hepatoblastoma or a liver lesion or a yolk sac tumor, please consult this algorithm, consult this chart and be sure that it is not within the normal for that age and try to find another test which will confirm whether this AFP is pathological, for example, do a biopsy. So importantly, these AFP have five to seven days half-life. Therefore, whenever we look at the response with chemotherapy or after surgery, we wait for about two to three half-lives, which is about three weeks, uh, two to three weeks, by which time we expect a reduction in the tumor marker, maybe by one log. So that is important to remember. So if we go back to the previous slide, Sandeep, then we can see if we go back to the previous slide, then what we previous slide, then we see that a tumor marker, AFP or beta HCG, they help us to diagnose the condition. They also very high levels means the disease burden is high. It helps us, as you will see in subsequent slides, in risk stratification and prognosis. And once the treatment is over and the tumor markers normalize, then in subsequent months, we can keep yes. the tumor marker as a surveillance tool. And often the tumor marker is elevated even before clinical or radiological signs of disease are evident. Next slide, please. And then the next. What about the beta HCG? The beta HCG is produced, as you saw, by syncytio trophoblast. It is elevated in all cases of choriocarcinoma in a substantial number of embryonal carcinomas and about a quarter of the yolk sac tumors. In seminomas, a slight elevation is also observed in about 7% then spurious elevations or elevations due to non-germ cell tumor can occur in other tumors like GI cancers, pancreatic, prostatic bladder, renal. So in these genitourinary cancers and some GI cancers. And also to remember that it is associated with certain uh, endocrine abnormalities, which we will see in the subsequent cases. LDH, as you know, is non-specific tool and reflects tumor burden, we never make a diagnosis. The most important thing is the AFP and beta HCG are very important clues in diagnosis. But LDH is not a clue to diagnosis, only to tumor burden. It is often elevated in 60 to 80 percent of the germ cell tumor patients. So we must differentiate. LDH can be raised in many other conditions, but AFP, beta HCG give us an important clue about diagnosis of germ cell tumor. Thank you. Over to you, Sandeep. Uh, Dr. Shalini, now uh, we have a uh, uh, patient with testicular germ cell tumor, and we know that uh, tumor markers are quite elevated. Uh, how do we steer this patient? So uh, for the staging, we need to do, we need to evaluate the uh, abdominal uh, lymph nodes, definitely. So lymphatic drainage of the testis is important. Uh, and we also need to know that which side we need to make a mark of which side the testicular uh, tumor is because as we all know the left sided testicular vein drains into the left renal vein and so the primary landing zone of, of the left testicular tumor will be in the paraortic region uh, up to the renal hilum whereas on the right side it drains directly into the inferior vena cava and hence the primary landing zone of the lymph nodes will be 
in the paracable retrocable regions. So because of the difference in both sides, we need to be uh, to make a note and especially definitely we need a uh, contrast enhanced CT to uh, the uh, demos if there are any retrograde lymph nodes. It's a very important part of the uh, staging because we need to know. And so based on this itself, you can see when later on, if suppose we have to do RPLND, the templates are different for the right side and the left side uh, because based on the primary landing zones. And also of the other, um, so when do we consider a lymph node if we, if, if we pick it up on contrast enhanced CT scan? So how do we consider is it pathological or is it just uh, something reactive? So I think most uh, places we take a cutoff of 10 millimeter on the short axis. And uh, so that is important. And if it's a very obvious bulky disease like we have in this patient of ours, uh, there is no doubt. We, he's got a huge seven into seven center mass. So we don't have to really uh, chase it. But when there are small lymph nodes, we have to be much more careful. And uh, based on the staging, usually they, they will consider it as, as stage three when it's more than four centimeters on radiology or uh, two, to, two to four centimeters when it is histopathologically proven. So if, if there's a doubt, if we can do a guided FNAC or a biopsy, uh, that would be a biopsy will be like a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection only, I think. Or at least uh, if it's a very small one, we can just do a laparoscopy and biopsy. It may not be always very easy to do a retroperitoneum. So uh, a careful evaluation is important. In germ cell tumor, even if the lymph node are suspicious, we do not biopsy them and we just put them under surveillance and we see their status once we give the uh, chemotherapy and later on. Uh, there are a few other things uh, that we should remember that uh, lymph node metastasis generally occurs on the same site. And if there is contralateral involvement, it occurs only when the tumor is very bulky. Uh, I mean, retroperitoneal uh, metastasis is very bulky or there is involvement from the other side of the for the, from the contralateral side. However, if the patient has undergone surgery prior, it may break the natural barriers and contralateral uh, side may also be involved. And whenever there is in vinyl lymphadenopathy, one should think that the scrotal skin involvement has occurred. And generally, the, as uh, Sir also told, uh, the, uh, in vinyl lymphadenopathy is not common in the testicular germ cell tumors. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shalini, would you like to comment about the need for doing a CT chest in a patient with uh, germ cell tumor or we can get away uh, only by doing a chest x-ray? So in, uh, in cases of seminoma, in cases of seminoma, if there is no abdominal uh, retroperitoneal lymph node in involvement, we can probably get away. But in non-seminoma germ cell tumors, we always prefer to do a uh, non-contrast CT chest, low dose CT chest. That is good enough because that's the most common site for metastasis. It could also be liver, so that that we can pick up on the CT abdomen. And uh, other th other things in staging would be if we're thinking of a choriocarcinoma, only then uh, we think about brain and bone and all that. But usually the common sac variety, we don't really go ahead with that. And as you said, vinyl lymph node. If there has been a transcrotal uh, okay. surgery done as the Bhagdi was also mentioning that sometimes uh, somebody op the surgeon opens thinking it's a hydrocele and then after opening up uh, this in the scrotal incision they realize it's a, a testicular tumor and then the the scrotal barrier has been uh, breached and after that they may get lymph nodes in the inguinal region I think in today's time if we talk about staging we cannot uh, get away without talking about pet scan uh, so, ma'am, can you tell us what is the role of PET scan in germ cell tumor? So, if we uh, if we look at the recommendations, then it is not mandatory in all cases of PET scan. Also, uh, routine staging we are not doing it. Um, why are we not doing it? Because it is unable to detect reliably or identify disease in small sub centimeter nodes and the level of evidence of this is a strong recommendation. That means whatever is data available, it shows that for small lymph nodes, PET scan is not very helpful. What is the role then? So the role could be where marker is positive, CT is negative. 
it could also be when you are following up patients with a resid residual viable seminoma. In the non-seminomatous germ cell tumor, where tumor markers are elevated, it is very easy to serially follow them with the tumor marker. But in seminoma, we often don't have a tumor marker that is elevated. So in these patients, when there is a, there is a lesion, which is more than three centimeters, PET could be useful. Of, of course, the final answer is un, given by histopathology. There may be some surgeons or clinicians who won't go by the PET report. They will say, I want to see, I want to take it out and I want to see what is there. So I think little bit of physician or surgeon discretion is also there. Yes, overall, there is very limited role of PET scan in, in uh, staging of uh, germ cell tumor. Uh, uh, Dr. Sajid, can you uh, uh, put a comment on the incidence of infertility and sperm cryopreservation before undergoing surgery for this patient? Uh, generally, generally, cryopreservation is not done for uh, testicular tumors in uh, children and mostly in adults also. Uh, it's generally not offered, uh, though it is said that uh, the uh, testicular tumors are may be associated with gonadal dysgenesis, dis and some of the patient may also have an oligospermia. But uh, infertility in testicular con uh, tumor is usually not a concern, and hence uh, cryopreservation, testicular tissue preservation is not very popular in testicular tumors. Okay. Uh, I think uh, there is some controversy about it and uh, some people actually uh, would want cryopreservation because uh, at the time of diagnosis, around half of the patient have oligospermia and 17% of the patient in germ cell tumor actually have permanent uh, uh, azospermia later on also after completion of treatment. Uh, so some centers advocate and uh, you are right and there is controversy about it and some center may not actually uh, prefer doing cryopreservation. It's probably more in the adult testicular tumor in, uh, rather than childhood testicular tumors. Yes, uh, in general, wherever it is feasible, maybe after age of 15 years, whenever there is a chance that uh, uh, there is a feasibility of uh, doing this, uh, then probably it should be offered. Sure. So now coming back to our case, uh, this. So this patient um, underwent a right high inguinal orchidectomy and on gloss examination revealed testis measuring 6.5 into 4.3 into 3.7 centimeter with a spermatic cord length of 6.5 centimeters. The cut surface uh, was showing a well circumscribed gray white lesion with cystic areas and the lesion was measuring 2.8 into 1.8 into 0.9 centimeters. Microscopic examination revealed that spermatic cord base epididymis and retitestis were free and uh, yolk sac tumor component was 40% and mature teratoma component was 60%. On immunohisto um, chemistry, the tumor cells expressed clapican 3, AFP and PLAP and teratomatous component were negative for above uh, markers. So the impression was it was a right testicular mixed germ cell tumor with yolk sac component 40% and teratoma component was 60%. Uh, so, sir, can you please uh, let us know what are the principles of surgery in testicular germ cell tumor? Okay. So, uh, the basic premise for uh, testicular tumor surgery is that not to approach the tumor from the scrotum. First of all, the approach, it has to be away from the scrotum and it's an inguinal approach. Uh, once we have explored the uh, inguinal canal, we have identified the spermatic cord. It is always better that we take a, a vascular occlusion. Soft vascular clamp uh, is usually applied at the uh, deep inguinal ring. And now once this is done, you can do manipulation of the testes. In the sense, you can bring out the testes out of the scrotum into the inguinal uh, wound what you have created. Once uh, we are certain that everything is uh, outside the scrotum, the gubernaculum is divided, all the facial tissue is divided, and uh, hemostasis is confirmed, we can do a, a, a ligation, high ligation of the cord and transection of the cord deep at the, the uh, deep inguinal ring. And generally, we call this as a radical orchidectomy because we are not doing any salvage of the uh, spermatic cord structure or the uh, uh, 
other structures associated with the testes. So it is uh, generally referred to as a radical orchidectomy. So uh, three things, inguinal approach, high ligation of the cord, and early vascular control. These are uh, uh, the three important things for uh, uh, orchidectomy. Now, uh, a small comment about uh, uh, is uh, testicular preservation, organ salvage possible in testicular tumors? Generally, generally, we go by this rule. If there is a doubt, the markers are not supporting you. And if there is a, a doubt about the lesion in the testes uh, being a tumor at all or some benign thing, we can do a procedure called as the Shiva Shoes procedure in which we just, whatever we did in the exploration, we apply a clamp, bring out the testes, and you can bisect the testes on the uh, border, the anterior border, and you can reach directly to the lesion. You can take a biopsy. If frozen section is available, you can do the frozen section. And if the histology is confirmed, you can go either for the orchidectomy or you can do a testicular preservation. A testicular preservation only uh, is, uh, I'm, uh, I, what I know of is testicular tumors, malignant germ cell tumor testicular preservation is not done. The only area where a testicular preservation can be done is a small testicular teratoma. Now, a decision for that has to be taken very judiciously and only in suitable cases, a testicular preservation surgery can be done. So that's about the surgery. And uh, uh, I have some more slides in this, if you can. Yes, this one, sir. Yeah. So still, if we have a situation, several instances where... Uh, in inadvertently, uh, instead of uh, uh, inguinal approach, a uh, scrotal approach is taken, and uh, suddenly we realize that it's a it's a testicular tumor, and so finish off the orchidectomy by doing ligating the cord just above at the root of the scrotum, and then there are some extra cautious guys who like for all like uh, they use the premise that we are not knowing what we are treating and knocking out someone's testes is a medical legal issue so we should do a fnac or do a biopsy before going for orchidectomy so that situation is also there usually it is generally it is not recommended to put a needle or do a testicular biopsy just to confirm the diagnosis in a setting of the Shiva Shoes manual, you can do a biopsy, when, but that is a setting where you have to be ready for going to the extremes in the sense that you can do orchidectomy then and there, and the scrotum incision is not being taken. Now, if we face a situation like this, the scrotal orchidectomy has been done. Now, what should be done? There is an implication on, on the stage. You, I'm sure you'll come on to that uh, later. But uh, is there a need for revising the scar? Is there a need for revising the spermatic cord, remove the uh, remnant spermatic cord? Those are the concerns, which I'm sure you, uh, this will be brought up uh, later in, or should I go ahead with just completion of that? Yes. Okay. Sandeep? Yes. Uh -huh. I think you can complete this now. Okay. Yes. So, so uh, there is, um, if there is margins positive, if they add this total orchidectomy, if the margins are positive, definitely there is a role for going ahead with a high ligation of the spermatic cord. Now, if the, if the thickening of the spermatic cord is extending beyond the uh, deep inguinal ring or up to the level of deep inguinal ring, getting a margin is not feasible. So in that situation, you have to uh, uh, you have to decide whether you want to go for a revision surgery now or you want to do the revision surgery after the chemotherapy. Definitely, this is an indication. Now, a similar situation of paratesticular RMS orchidectomy done through a scrotal incision, is there a role, because that's a rhabdomyosarcoma, it's a, it's a sarcoma, so there is a, 
a role for some PRE, that is treatment relaxation, and people have advocated hemispedectomy, which is also dubious now in uh, the paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma area. There is no evidence for a hemispedectomy in germ cell tumor for the simple fact that we have good chemotherapy for this. But yes, a scrotal in, uh, orchidectomy uh, increases or puts the puts the child on risk for uh, metastasis to the inguinal lymph node because of violation of the lymphatic veins. So that's the significance. So if a scrotal orchidectomy has been done, should we go ahead with a hemisprotectomy? There is uh, no definite evidence to say for that. If the or scrotal orchidectomy is done and the margins are positive, yes, we can go ahead with revision surgery, doing a high inguinal uh, high ligation of the cord if possible. If not possible, if the disease is extending up to the deep inguinal ring, you should not be heroic and go for a surgery at that point because you may not get a good margin. So you can defer the surgery in that situation. So that's what uh, that's about uh, uh, scrotal orchidectomy and the scar. How do we manage the scar? And sir, in any subset of patient, would you do the contralateral testicular biopsy? Oh, uh, no. In, in childhood tumors, definitely there is no role for uh, uh, contralateral testicular biopsy. There may be in, uh, in children with cryptorchidism or in presence of microleukiasis, but definitely there is no strong evidence. And we generally, in our clinical practice, we don't uh, do a contralateral testicular biopsy. Uh, in management of testicular tumors. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ma'am, can you tell us about the various histological subtype of testicular germ cell tumor and what is the role of immunohistochemistry in differentiating these subtypes? So, as you can see here, the germ cell tumors, we nicely classify them as seminomatous and non seminomatous. And they are, these are actually arising, these are germinal neoplasms. And if you see the non seminomatous, they are constituted by the yolk sac tumor, embryonal carcinoma, teratoma, choriocarcinoma, and if there is a mixture of these, it's called mixed. The non-germinal stromal tumors are the Leydig cell tumors, and the other tumors which may arrive from the germ cells are the gonadoblastoma, and also involvement is seen by lymphomas and leukemias of the testes, but then obviously those are not germ cell tumors. So we have seminoma, non-seminomatous germ cell tumors, and stromal tumors, which we have to remember. The other important thing to remember is that in younger children, as we have already heard, the most common histology is the teratoma in the prepubertal children. And in the postpubertal, it's the yolk sac. Then in the young in children, in the pediatric testicular tumors, the seminoma, embryonal carcinoma, choriocal are very less frequent. They are more seen in the adolescent and young adult age group. So teratomas in infants and yolk sac in the adults. Then what about the role for the tumor markers? This is a very nice uh, algorithmic table. And actually, what is this OCT4? When we were training, OCT4 did not exist. We had to rely totally on AFP and beta HCG. But now we have quite a number of new tumor markers. So OCT4 is a gatekeeper, which is essential for maintenance of pluripotency in the embryonal stem cells. It is present in every case of seminoma. So it has 100% sensitivity for the seminoma. So if OCT4 is positive, of the various components or different histological subtypes, we can get a clue that it is positive in both seminoma and in the embryonal carcinoma, while the yolk sac and the other choriocarcinoma are negative for it. So then how do we differentiate between seminoma and embryonal carcinoma? It is by using CD117 and CD30. The seminoma is positive for 117, and the embryonal carcinoma being negative for 117 is positive for CD30. So this helps us to, these three markers will help us differentiate seminoma from embryonal carcinoma. Now, amongst the opt negative ones, although we already have the AFP beta HCG with us, but among, in the IHC, a new marker is the glycan 3 which you have already heard in the previous slide. So presence of glycopan with or without AFP is seen in yolk sac. Glycan negative tumors are the spermatocytic seminomas, which are negative for all these other markers. 
So it is negative for everything, improving OCT4, glypicam, AFP, beta HCG. But the choriocarcinoma is characteristically positive for the beta HCG. The glypicam 3 may be plus minus. AFP is negative. So here we see beta HCG helping out with the choriocarcinoma. The OCT4117 CD34 helping us to differentiate seminoma from embryonal carcinoma. And the glypicam very much helpful along with AFP for the yolk site. Right? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. I think uh, the clinical uh, context and tumor marker are very important and followed by morphology, which is still the gold standard, but in about 8 to 10 percent of the patient where there is uncertain histogenesis, ISC can help us to have the correct diagnosis. So, uh, so can we now, uh, how do we stage this patient and also restratify uh, germ cell tumor, testicular germ cell tumor? So, uh, Dr. Sajid, can you hear us? I think... Uh, uh, Dr. Shalini, can you uh, take up this? Uh, I think Dr. Sajid is not... Or shall I uh, continue? I think that uh, one of you can do. I will try to contact Sajid. I think his uh, network is out. I'll okay. just try to call him. So in general, the stage one tumors are which are limited to the testis and there is no residual uh, disease left behind after the surgery. And also the tumor markers are negative post-surgery. In stage two, in stage two, only microscopic disease is left behind after surgery that may be in form of uh, positive margins or cut end of the spermatic cord may be positive or there are just uh, positive tumor markers in absence of any microscopic disease. Uh, in patients whom uh, where we don't have the surgical details and patient has been operated outside, we still take it as stage two. And if there is retroperitoneal lymph node involvement, it is stage three. And if there is distant metastasis, which is generally hematogenous, then we take it as stage four. Uh, Dr. Sajid, can you hear us? I have uh, yes. just told the stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can carry on with the certification. Okay. So uh, this is the general risk stratification what we have in for all testicular tumors, uh, depending on the stage. The stage is one, two, three, four, the regular conventional one. And uh, we have a risk stratification now in which the stage one uh, testicular tumor. This is the old one. This is the one which we have been practicing. And there is a new one now, which is based on the magic uh, evaluation and the magic study, which is going to happen, or it's rather initiated. So all testicular tumors and all stage one ovarian tumors and all immature teratomas, which are excised completely, are characterized as low risk. The stage two to four, yeah, that means all testicular tumor which are more than stage one are intermediate. Stage two and stage three ovarian tumors are intermediate. And there is no extragonadal germ cell tumor, which is stage one. So the intermediate extragonadal germ cell tumor risk stratification starts at intermediate risk. Stage one and stage two are uh, extragonadal. And this is a, a controversial thing, immature teratoma. If the immature teratoma is incompletely excised, we err on a higher side and we place them in intermediate risk for the uh, uh, benefit of rather giving them the benefit of chemotherapy. We know that immature teratoma and chemotherapy are a, a topic of discussion uh, separate. But because of the concerns of relapses in immature teratoma, we are placing them intermediate risk so that they can receive chemotherapy. The low risk do not require chemotherapy, just based on the temptation of making them eligible for chemotherapy, we are placing in, incompletely excised immature teratoma. And some would say the grade three immature teratoma as intermediate risk so that they can receive chemotherapy. The, uh, the uh, metastatic ones are stage four and even the incompletely excised or the biopsied extra gonadal germ cell tumor are the high risk tumors. And then subsequently there is this, uh, uh, the magic risk stratification which has come, 
which is in which has expanded the scope uh, in uh, uh, of uh, uh, germ cell tumor including the adolescents also and here for the first time there is a age criteria which is included 11 years cut off is been taken and that is utilized for risk stratification and also the igcc the international germ cell consensus classification of good risk good intermediate and poor which is an amalgamation of several thing including the uh, tumor markers and the <coughs> other features which is uh, classifies them into good intermediate and poor these are utilized to uh, give a risk stratification and this is Uh, basically of uh, the low risk and the standard risk is having uh, two uh, levels that is standard risk 1 and standard risk 2 and the poor risk 1 here for the first time the testicular tumor some of the testicular tumors we say all even if metastatic testicular tumors they can be uh, placed in non high risk that is intermediate risk but here is a subset of patient have been identified of testicular tumor which is 2 to 4 stage 2 to 4 and who are more than 11 years and the igcc uh, uh, intermediate or poor risk they are placed in the poor risk which is equivalent of the high risk tumor so this is a, a basically a mathematical thing and uh, based on this risk stratification with an addition of the age criteria the magic trial is uh, initiated and we'll have the results and the details of that is readily available and the uh, the chemotherapy and the uh, uh, drugs and dosage are different in the different uh, risk level so i'm sure that will be highlighted by some people in the future studies Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, I think uh, sir has nicely summed up how uh, the adult staging system is different from the pediatric staging system. The adult people use mainly IgCCC classification. In pediatric, this is magic, and this has been published by Frazier et al. in JCO 2016. And I think all fellows must read this, that paper. That is very important from understanding the historical aspects of how this magic came into picture and how it is being used in the current uh, AgCT. Uh, 1531 trial uh, which is a collaboration between cog and ukcclg uh, i think i'm not going into detail of this and uh, let's move to the second case now and varsha can you present this case so our second case is a 17 year old girl presented with lower abdominal pain and distension for 10 days and had fever for last 7, seven days there was no history of any constitutional symptoms like vomiting or weight loss she attained her menarche at 13 years of age and had regular menstrual cycles since then her weight and height were between 50th and 75th centile for her age and sex her vitals were normal there were no signs of hirsutism or virilization and her tanner was 5 on a um, per abdominal examination there was a mass palpable in the left lumbar and suprapubic area measuring about 8 into 10 cm it was non tender firm had smooth surface and was mobile from side to side the ultrasound abdomen revealed a large lobulated heteroechoic solid cystic lesion in the lower central ab abdomen arising from the left adnexa and the left ovary was not visualized separately and few echogenic foci of calcifications were seen and mild to moderate ascites was also seen so this is the axial section and this is the sagittal section of the ct abdomen and pelvis uh, showing a heterogeneously enhancing mass in the, uh, arising from the left adnexa measuring about 8 into 10 into 11 cm and we can see some um, calcific foci and um, scattered fat densities in the mass ascites and omental caking is also noted no lymphadenopathy was seen and right ovary and uterus were normal so the blood investigation revealed a normal cbc kft lft uh, among tumor markers afp was markedly raised beta hcg was also raised and serum ldh was also in the higher values Uh, so, Dr. Shalini, can you tell us about what are the presenting uh, symptoms of ovarian mass in children, and what important points we should note down in the history and clinical examination when dealing with these uh, cases? Uh, so, I think uh, ovarian tumors, uh, which present them the most most commonly there in the adolescent age group, uh, at least 
peripubertal, and most common presentation is abdominal pain. So abdominal pain can be because of various other reasons. So we need to distinguish, and if we find a pelvic mass with which is painful, we also need to differentiate from other benign uh, pathologies, like there could be a tubular with an abscess, especially in adolescent or uh, you know uh, uh, young adult girls, and also there could be a torsion in a benign cyst. Uh, so we need to really uh, differentiate whether it's a malignant tumor or not. And sometimes they can present with an acute ab abdomen either because of torsion or because of rather of the tumor or because of hemorrhage. Uh, and uh, there can be some symptoms related to the compression uh, with bowel bladder uh, alteration or nausea vomiting. And very rarely, but we do see these pre prepubertal children who present with sterilization or precocuity because of the functioning uh, ovarian, uh, either a functional ovarian cyst, or it could also be one of the Sertoli Leydig cell tumors. And uh, uh, it's important to get a menstrual history, uh, finding out specifically the last men menstru menstrual cycle, because you know if it's a sexually active girl, whether there's ectopic pregnancy, which is presenting like a mass, and we, we, we may not know that. Unless we get that history, we may not suspect, especially in the Indian scenario. And of course, I, I mentioned about uh, tubo within uh, uh, abscess or pelvic inflammatory disease and uh, a variety of uh, sexually transmitted diseases also. So we need to get that history, especially in the uh, adolescent girls. And on examination, uh, usually if you, uh, we all know that if there is an ovarian tumor, for any exam, whether it's a surgical exam, 100% that case will be kept for the exam. So we should know the classical findings of an ovarian mass. So the most important thing is that it is arises from pelvis and we cannot get below the mass. And usually there's very well defined margins, the germ cell tumors that we see in children. And they have a good amount of side to side mobility, even in the malignant tumors. And of course, so you can see here, uh, this this is not this this particular child you can see this is a prepubertal pre nine year old girl, and uh, this was also a malignant germ cell tumor uh, being taken up for afferent surgery. You can see how much mobility that ovarian mass has got, and so this is a very classical feature which will help us in differentiating whether it's a retroperitoneal or an ovarian mass. Next slide. Yeah. Hello, I can't hear you, Sandeep. Dr. Sandeep, you have to unmute. Yes. Uh, yes. Ma'am, now uh, this child has undergone ultrasound and uh, how, what information can we get from the ultrasound and why is it important to differentiate whether this is a benign lesion or malignant lesion? Can you... Uh, so this is really important that before we go for surgery, we should have in our mind what is the possibility. So, uh, of course, the first investigation available to most of us wherever we are located periphery or in a two tier city or in a you know big city, metropolitan or metropolitan city is that ultrasound is available to all of us so as you have already heard it tells you organ of origin it tells you what is its size what is its extent is it solid is it cystic and what is the other ovary like are there lymph nodes is there flea fluid in the abdomen so these are gross things also what is the liver doing and you know is there a disease anywhere else is the kidney okay in addition, it has been found that there are some features which are very characteristic of benign lesions and some characteristic of the malignant ones. So tumors less than 10 centimeters, primarily cystic, with normal tumor markers, are usually benign. While uh, And in benign lesions, the most important thing is that we don't want to remove the entire ovary. And if you look at this, uh, this uh, study, which was published just this year, 2020, of 819 uh, patients with ovarian masses uh, from 10 different hospitals. And if you see that they saw out of these 819, 89% were benign lesions. And the factors that predicted were younger age, more than 10 centimeter size, sorry, less than 10 centimeter size. So, okay, more than 10 centimeters solid component lymph node means malignant. So, 
younger age, more than 10 centimeters, solid component, presence of lymph node, predicted malignancy. And important to remember that 89% were actually benign. So why do we want to know is it benign or malignant? Because if it is malignant, you want to remove the whole ovary. You don't want to preserve any normal ovarian tissue. But if it is benign, then we it has been seen that even with large ovarian cystic masses, there is a residual functional ovarian tissue in the ovary, which is a pathological. Sorry, in the diseased ovary also, there is normal tissue and you don't want to remove it. You want to preserve this ovarian tissue. Why is that so? It has been seen that even those where benign for benign lesion, you remove the ovary, there is reduced ovarian reserve, premature ovarian failure leading to problems with cardiac and skeletal health. Even they have seen that there is early menopause, there is dementia, there is decline in cognitive function. And there is a higher risk of malignancy in the contralateral ovary. Therefore, it is very important that when before rushing in for a surgery, we try to determine is it malignant or benign. And as you have even heard for testicular, Dr. Sajid said, if you're suspicious or not sure it's malignant, you could do a frozen and try to find out by other means whether this is malignant and if the whole ovary really needs to come out. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Sajid, can, can you tell us about the principle of surgery in a patient with a ovarian germ cell tumor? And uh, in which cases will you consider upfront chemotherapy instead of surgery? Right. So the video by Shalini, that answered a lot of questions. The nice demonstration of, of the mobility of the tumor by uh, the videos uh, Shalini just shared, that's the criteria what we usually see for operability before the scans. Once that doesn't mean that you have to operate all the patient who ha are having a mobile mass. Large masses wherein the incision could be a real Sir, I think you have muted yourself. Oh. Uh, on CT scan, if we have ascites, if we have omental caking, if we have extensive disease, those are the patients you should not be operating them up front. So, ideal small lesion or mobile lesion with localized disease within the ovary, those are the candidates we select for upfront surgery. Now, uh, if you can show me the next slide. This radiological uh, uh, imaging is very important. It gives you an idea what you will be facing inside. One side you are having a solid mass and one side you are having a predominantly cystic mass. There is a solid component in this and we have not shown that. So, in this, this gives you an idea that what you are supposed to be doing, you have to be extra careful because tumor rupture is something which we do, sh should not be uh, hoping that there should be any tumor rupture. So investigation and assessment of that is very important. The We usually, there are several incision people have taken and there are some guys who also believe that ovarian tumors can be managed laparoscopically. Uh, I would caution, please don't use your uh, gadgets, laparoscopes for testicular, uh, sorry, ovarian tumors. I am strictly against, and people are strictly against using laparoscopy or robotic surgery for ovarian uh, germ cell tumors or other ovarian tumors. So we usually prefer a midline incision, intra-umbilical incision, or the incision can be extended. We usually do not advocate a financial incision for large tumor because if there is a need for mobilization, if there is a need of adhesion, involvement of adjacent structure, even after chemotherapy, then you can cannot extend the incision with the financing. But right. it's so a problem problem the for a financing right. or a midline incision. So I prefer a midline incision. So if there is a need to extend the incision because the ovary is not deliverable, or I find some new things, or if there are retroperitoneal lymph node, uh, a midline incision help. Once the abdomen is open, before doing anything, you have to take the ascitic fluid for cytology. And if ascitic fluid is not present, 
then you should be giving a wash in the pelvis and you should aspirate that wash and send it for cytology. You should inspect the abdomen. First, you should deal with the ovary, get the ovary outside the abdomen, deliver the ovary outside the wound, surgical wound by gentle manipulation and taking care at each step that you should not be rupturing the ovary. Once you have brought out the ovary, can, can uh, you uh, take the next slide? Yeah. So here the ovary is brought out. The uh, thing on the left side is the ovarian tumor. The thing which I'm holding with the thumb and the index, that's the contralateral tube. And you can see the normal ovary. So you should examine the contralateral ovary and examine the pelvic structure. This is a straightforward uh, left-sided salpingo ophorectomy. We are not going to do a biopsy also here. Uh, if you, uh, yeah, this side, uh, you can remove the salpingo, do a salpingo ophorectomy. The picture on the left, salpingo ophorectomy has been done. And picture on the right, only the ophorectomy has been done. The salpings is preserved. Uh, if we move on to the next, this is a typical example where you see you have those uh, uh, the cystic area. Here we say the tumor is extending over the capsules. And these are for the reason that uh, they may easily rupture. This, uh, these type of tumor have to be uh, managed very carefully. So you can do a salpingo ophorectomy. That takes care of the primary. The surgery is not over yet. The most important part of uh, uh, the, the surgical staging is you after doing the salpingo ophorectomy, you may or may not want to address the omentum. Omentum uh, people have a view that we should not be removing the over omentum like what we do in adults with epithelial tumors, omentectomy for all. In children, we remove the omentum only if it is adherent to the tumor. We inspect the omentum and if the omentum is normal, omentectomy is generally not required. We uh, palpate and visualize the uh, peritoneal surface. Uh, it includes the paracolic gutters, the anterior parietal peritoneum, the pelvic peritoneum, the infradiaphragmatic surface, uh, the infradiaphragmatic peritoneum have to be inspected and palpated. Any suspicious lesion should be biopsied. And, <coughs> sorry. and finally, you should palpate the retroperitoneum. Uh, again, like testicular tumor, the primary drainage is in the retroperitoneum, not the pelvic node or <clears throat> the external iliac node. So the retroperitoneum have to be palpated. And if nodes are enlarged, then only those need to be biopsied. You need not biopsy if you're not able to see or palpate any lymph node. Now, this is the slides. What you're seeing is an example of a, a ovarian preserving surgery. The contralateral ovary has been removed and now there is a disease relapse on the other side. And uh, it was a suspicious case and it turned out to be a teratoma. It was a single ovary. So here in this case, we have done a organ preservation surgery. Next slide. And here, finally, the tumor is removed and the residual ovary and parent capsule, whatever small amount of capsule is there, is sutured after taking care of the hemostasis. Uh, so that is about the, and, uh, uh, the golden rule. We are doing, uh, try to preserve as much as possible uh, at least one ovary or some ovary. If, but... If you have a situation like this, where none of the ovary in parent, none of the ovary is having any normal ovary parenchyma, you would be forced to do a bilateral oophorectomy. But generally, we avoid a oophor bilateral oophorectomy. If you encounter a situation like this, you can go for a unilateral oophorectomy and you know, close the abdomen, give your chemotherapy if not given. And if you have a situation like this, that even after chemotherapy, if the ovaries are looking like this, you can't help it. You have to go ahead with a bilateral salping ophorectomy or bilateral ophorectomy. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the, uh, the uh, omentum. 
only the omentum the bottom omentum is a complete omentectomy because there were nodules in the omentum and the upper two picture the only omentum which was attached to the uh, ovary has been removed so those are the general surgical principle for ovarian tumors and i think uh, sir has already answered uh, this should be avoided laparoscopic and robotic surgery in ovarian germ cell tumor must be avoided Uh, so uh, let's come uh, uh, again to the histological subtype of now ovarian germ cell tumor ma'am can you tell us uh, is there any difference between the testicular and ovarian germ cell tumor in this regard in this regard mostly it is the same except for the fact that when the seminoma occurs in the ovary we call it disgerminoma the rest are more or less the same and most again to remember that ovarian tumors are often benign and amongst the malignant one in children two third are germ cell tumor which include the disgerminoma and the, which include all of these but as i showed you before the seminoma or disgerminoma and immature teratoma are less common so yolk site is one of the common ones okay thank you ma'am uh, dr shalini can we uh, uh, do it uh, slightly uh, fast so that we have two more cases to cover in next 20 minutes how do we stage and certify ovarian uh, germ cell tumor so uh, we will discuss the uh, cog st staging which is what we uh, commonly follow um, the adult people they follow the figo staging which we will we are not going to go into the details so as uh, most of the tumors uh, we, we know that stage 1 and the disease is limited to the ovary and it's been completely excised we must have a negative peritoneal washing and there should not be any disease extending beyond the ovary and uh, also if the tumor markers come down to normal uh, based on the half life stage 2 when there is pillage or there is a breach in the uh, capsule or or the lymph nodes are less than 2 cm lymph nodes have been affected or microscopic residual disease is there again peritoneal washing should be negative tumor markers may be either stage 3 when there is macroscopic residual disease or somebody has done just initial biopsy or uh, adjoining bowel bladder or omentum has been uh, is involved or there is peritoneal positive peritoneal washing or there are peritoneal seedings or also lymph nodes more than 2 cm are involved then we call it stage 3 and stage 4 of course is the distant metastasis and you can also say hidden disease when actually it is looking like no microscopic disease left but tumor markers are still persistent and out of normal range by the complete surgery so dr shalik can you tell us what is the stage of our tumor patient now okay so our our patient had uh, i think there's a surgical slide i think i'm so okay this this, this patient had a left oophorectomy and uh, with infracolecomentectomy she had ascites to begin with and uh, also there was some uh, involvement of the omentum and that's why the capsule was intact and it was a yolk sac component and uh, although the peritoneal fluid analysis uh, was negative uh, the, the the deposits and the mental deposits and lymph nodes were also negative and this impression so this will be omentum had uh, actually tumor deposits omentum had yeah. tumor deposits actually it, yes but the, on the histo lymph nodes was negative right them yeah. had tumor deposits so obviously it is stage 3 uh because we had uh, ascites also and and a mental deposit was also positive so this patient was stage 3 so i can just go through a few quick uh, few scenarios and if we go by the figo you want to go through the scenarios we, first uh, no we'll we'll just discuss this part about the uh, what is the difference between figo and uh, okay uh, okay figo which is important next slide so it's important that if we look at this uh, particular whenever there is microscopic disease it is still here it's 1a whereas for us microscopic disease here in cog it's 2 and th this particular patient where we got the positive peritoneal cyt cytology is 1c whereas for if we get a positive peritoneal cytology it is stage 3 so in the adult i think the the epithelial tumors are more aggressive and their peritoneal disease and hence they are kind of down staging whereas when we follow for cog uh, cog uh, staging for children it uh, works out better definitely next slide and also they don't consider the tumor markers in the figo staging next slide so when you go to uh, risk group i think we've already gone through that it is the same 
like for testicular. So, so what, how do we stage if we have a bilateral ovarian tumor like Dr. Sajid has shown that uh, particular uh, specimen uh, uh, picture. So when we have a bilateral previous slide, bilateral tumor, ovarian tumor, we have to stage independently, something similar to Wilms tumor. And also whichever is the higher stage tumor, we'll be treating according to that. Mm -hmm. So again, if capsule is breached, it is two, peritoneal washings are positive or peritoneal deposits are there. It is uh, stage three. Next slide. Next slide. So you can see some peritoneal deposits here and uh, we had also removed the omentum. Uh, the previous slide. Okay, this is just... Uh, this is just one patient with germ cell tumor who had a lot of normal ovarian tissue left. And so I did a, a partial uh, oophorectomy and uh, this is just showing the uh, ovary on this side, that's the opposite side. And that's a tumor excise with a margin, we got a negative margin. Next, next, next. 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 Now we are going back. We need to go forward. Okay. Risk grouping. Okay. You are, you are, you need to unmute Dr. Sandeep. We okay. can't hear you, Dr. Okay, okay. And this is a risk grouping. So all stage one tumors are low risk. And intermediate age wise, as uh, Dr. Sajid has shown uh, based on the MAGIC trial. So stage two, four up years and more than 11 years, stage two to three. And poor risk will be all stage four, more than 15 years. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thank Shani. You. I think now we can move to a couple of cases of extra gondal tu uh, tumor and Dr. Payal uh, will be uh, telling us about those cases. Over to you, Dr. Payal. A very good evening to all of you. I know everybody is waiting for it to finish and I'll try to uh, take you all through the journey of extra gonadal with a bullet speed. So let us start now. So uh, this is a case. So this was a 14-year-old male from New Delhi who presented with complaints of cough, chest pain, and fever. However, there was no history of respiratory distress, weight loss, or night sweats. In view of his progressive symptoms, he was investigated. A chest X-ray was done, which yeah. showed cardiomegaly. In view of that, he was referred to a cardiologist who did an echo, which was absolutely normal. He was also investigated on the lines of tuberculosis because of fever and uh, mm -hmm. cough. However, the uh, workup was negative. An ultrasound showed splenomegaly. Subsequently, a CT chest was done, which showed an anterior mediastinal mass. And then, of course, the patient, he moved to Rajiv Gandhi for further workup. So when we examined him, uh, the vitals were stable, saturation was normal, there was air entry was markedly reduced on the left side, and there was gynecomasia. So this is the child. You can see that there was significant gynecomasia that was present. We did CBC, which was normal. The blood chemistries were normal. We reviewed the chest X-ray that was done outside. And when we reviewed it, Something that was reported as cardiomegaly was actually a lobulated mass, which was a mediastinal mass. And there was another interesting thing that I want to point out is that you can see that there is breast shadow of this boy, which almost looks like an adult breast. So my first question is for Dr. Sajid. Sir, if we have a 14-year-old male who has got a mediastinal mass and has gynecomasia, what all must not be missed while examining this kind of a patient and what are the diagnostic clues? The gynecomastia, first of all, just point out towards uh, a gonadal dysgenesis. So uh, that things should uh, should be kept in mind. Gonadal dysgenesis and Klein fetal syndrome. These two are things which uh, should be uh, looked for in a child with uh, a mediastinal mass and uh, 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 gynecomastia. You can also have a situation of precocious puberty. So that has to be looked upon in a child with mediastinal mass. And for the primary per se, is the mediastinal mass causing any problem, which is could be a, a medical or a surgical emergency that has to be looked in. And that includes the airway and that includes the SPC 
and uh, the Pemberton sign is a usual uh, good uh, assessment. You can ask the person to raise his uh, both limb, upper limb above the shoulder and you can uh, look for the engorgement of the neck pain. So Pemberton sign can also be uh, uh, useful for assessment for the SVC syndrome. So these are some of the things we should be well aware uh, while we are doing addressing uh, mediastinal mass and that goes germ cell tumor. Thank you, sir. So uh, we saw the CT chest. The CT chest showed a heterogeneously enhancing large mediastinal mass and it showed some amount of calcification also. My next question uh, is for Dr. Gauri. So ma'am, we have this 14-year-old male who's got cough, fever and gynecomasia. He's got an anterior mediastinal mass. Can you uh, tell it uh, for the fellow's point of view, how do we approach such a case? So, you know, we should start with the history examination. And starting with, if we say this is a young person with an anterior mediastinal mass. So anterior mediastinal mass, young person, short history. The first thing we think of is lymphoma or a leukemia with a mediastinal mass. So I want to do a CBC and a peripheral smear. Make sure they are normal or if they are abnormal, proceed with a bone marrow. In our case, as you know, CBC was perfectly normal. We did not do the marrow. So the next step will be, this child did not have any signs of SVC syndrome. He was not very sick. There was not much distress. It was like a, almost like a quiet chest. So I went ahead and ordered tumor markers. And that came out to be positive. Although mid, amongst all mediastinal germ cell tumors, amongst all mediastinal masses, germ cell tumor is not the commonest in this age group. But a tumor marker is such a non-invasive test and gives such an important information about diagnosis that it should be done where a CPC and a marrow are normal. Next. So in this case, next slide, uh, Shalini, uh, sorry. Yeah, just move the slides, uh, Payal. Yeah. So, the, so I would actually, in this age group, go for first diagnosis mm -hmm. of either a lymphoblastic lymphoma or a leukemia with the involvement of the mediastinum, that like a T leukemia. The other common then will be the germ cell and the Ewing sarcoma, which can also occur in the uh, in these children. However, Ewing's usually would be a chest wall. Ewing's pure mediastinal mass is unlikely. There was no bony involvement. So again, that is excluded. Uh, I think, uh, doctor, doctor ma'am. Thygoma and tuberculosis are very unusual in this, uh, in this scenario where we have a short history. Next. Therefore, another thing we had in this case was gynecomastia. And there was a calcification in the node. So again, these things were narrowing the diagnosis and favoring a next favoring germ cell tumor. File next. So um, uh, as ma'am rightly said that gynecomasia pointed out uh, towards uh, the fact that this could be GCT. Therefore, we did uh, tumor markers. And if tumor markers are raised, we know that While your connection is gone, while we can't hear you, Dr. Sandeep. Um, I think they've got disconnected. Okay, mm -hmm. back. I'll just. The screen share is also gone. I can I can screen share. I think there's a technical issue from their end. Yeah. Should I? I have that PPT. Should I share it? Uh, you, you, otherwise, you can just tell us uh, how do these tumors present, Shalini. Shalini, uh, I think sp that? speak without the slide. That'll be the best. By the time the PhD, eco people will put it back. File, file, slide share. File, slide share. File. I 
and we are not moving we all are there we are not there tumhare wahan pe aajo thoda Can you see the slides? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I think uh, now can we can see the slides. Okay. Uh, uh, just one second. Uh, I'm doing the slides, ma'am. You're doing. Shall I stop the share? Yes, 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 yes. Shalini, keep keep with the slides. Keep the slides, Shalini. Okay, Shalini, keep the slides. Okay, ma'am, I'm keeping. Yes, can you see? Okay. So, yes. uh, slide forward. Yeah. Uh, so uh, since uh, so for this i think we can do tumor markers and if tumor markers are raised we know that clear cut it is a germ cell tumor without even going ahead with a biopsy next slide ma'am ma'am next slide please okay right so we did the tumor markers afp and hcg were raised and therefore a diagnosis of germ cell tumor was established next slide shalini ma'am So, uh, Dr. Shalini, the next question is for you. So, now that we have the diagnosis of a mediastinal germ cell tumor, how do these tumors present? So, um, many of the times they may be just asymptomatic, or they may just present with localized symptoms and pressure effects. Uh, already, it's been mentioned about SVC syndrome, cough, fever, chest, and uh, systemic symptoms are rare. We must also look for any associated uh, anomalies like Klinefelter syndrome and paraneoplastic syndromes. Okay. So this is just showing a SVC syndrome. This SVC was not seen earlier, and now this is you can see it after that was after the chemotherapy. And this is showing that there's about thirty percent of patients with Klinefelter syndrome they, they do develop germ cell tumor. Okay, so uh, my next question is for Dr. Gauri. Uh, Dr. Gauri, is it mandatory in this patient to do a biopsy because we already have a raised tumor markers? a whole clinical scenario and if we are in a peripheral sector then a biopsy is very risky i think that on the basis of this we have a young person with this clinical scenario with gynecomastia with very elevated afp beta hcg i would do a metastatic workup make sure that there are no mets in the liver that the liver is normal ct chest we have already done so i can actually proceed with treatment but if you are in a center like tata hospital i think that you will want tissue because you want to do molecular analysis and also you want to know what is a teratomatous component in this tissue because that will help you later on if there is a residual mass to know whether you want to do monitoring or you actually want to go in and remove the tumor so i think in those in in that way uh, there can be a physician decision whether to go for a biopsy or to proceed with treatment thank you ma'am so uh, we have done a biopsy and we actually the biopsy results came much later after the tumor markers So biopsy was suggestive of a query germ cell tumor or a gabbloomyosarcoma. So actually it was confusing when the biopsy came, but I think we had the jigsaw already of the puzzle already in place and we knew that it was a germ cell tumor. Next slide. Next slide. So uh, on immunohistochemistry, uh, we had markers positive for yolk site and choriocarcinoma with raised AFP and beta HCG. Next slide. And we know that the common histological type, specifically for mediastinal germ cell tumor, is actually a yolk sac germinoma and a choriocarcinoma or mixed. So in our case, it was a mixed germ cell tumor. Next slide. I want to just uh, go through the cytogenetic abnormalities in mediastinal germ cell tumor. We don't know how much prognostic or therapeutic impact even if it has. Probably it is more of a academic interest, as Dr. Gauri mentioned. So uh, there are three main cytogenetic abnormalities. One is uh, trisomy eight. Uh, Dr. Shalini, can you please go ahead? Which is seen in sixteen percent and Klinefelter syndrome in almost twenty percent. And third and most common is what you see is isochromosome twelve p. Next slide, Dr. Shalini, which is seen in almost forty percent of these patients. And this is actually not present in a carcinoma in C two. 
although it is present in both semiromatous and non semiromatous uh, germ cell tumors yeah, next slide so uh, uh, my next question is for dr sajid and previous slide please once we have the final diagnosis how do we stage the risk stratify uh, media stain germ cell tumor so for the media skin and germ cell tumor uh, the ct scan uh, gives us the relation with the vessels and the other structures and more importantly it also give us the status of the lung so we can uh, characterize this as metastatic or non metastatic majority of the germ cell tumor in the media stenoms are too large or the compress critical structure or uh, displace the heart or displace the great vessels so it's not a good idea in uh, taking these type of patient for afferent surgery a scenario where the markers are normal there is a big mediastinal mass and it is more of a teratoma that situation yes there is an indication for an afferent surgery even if it is a, a, a little risky because it's a teratoma and your chemotherapy we know is not going to work based on the this diagnosis of teratoma is based on the radiology and the tumor markers not with an histology with the mediastinal teratoma the signs are very clear it's a large mass there are calcification there are fat shadows etc cetera, etc cetera. but if it is a malignant germ cell tumor with an elevated afp those are uh, 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 generally not candidate for upfront surgery if you are not doing any surgery in the beginning we have to stage them as stage 3 that is only only a biopsy or only no treatment has been given and here if it is stage 3 the risk stratification it has to be uh, the the third one uh, if we keep aside the magic it is the high risk so most of these tumors yeah most of these tumors go into the risk stage 3 and uh, risk as high risk and they go for upfront chemotherapy and that's how we go about and once uh, based on uh, the chemotherapy response uh, we uh, move forward with uh, uh, the local treatment which usually in most scenario is surgery can you move the slides next dr sajid sir you next please Next, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the same thing. I was trying yeah, to impress that how bad this could be, and uh, this is a surgery. Yeah. I think we have discussed this. We can go forward. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so just to emphasize that Dr. Sajid mentioned that mediastinal germ cell tumors are um, not low, low risk by most of the groups. Uh, it is either intermediate risk or high risk, and mainly because they are not amenable to resection in starting. Um, next slide, ma'am. And also, if you look at the NCC and classification, media stain, ma'am. Previous slide, please. If you look at the NCC and classification, media stain germ cell tumors uh, come in the poor risk. Next slide. So our patient was high risk stage three media stain germ cell tumor. Next slide, ma'am. and this is the surgical uh, pitch okay so i think that the slides are also going here and there but that's okay so this is the next one just move on pile just move on we have seen the surgical picture okay <laughs> so uh, <laughs> okay i i want to tell about this guy gordon who reported the credit for mediastinal germ cell tumor goes to him in 1827 he reported the first case of mediastinal germ cell tumor with hair and teeth there was a big no no to accept that something from gonads could go and sit somewhere else in mediastinum or in retroperitoneum or in sacrum or in the brain and uh, so it has taken almost 5 decades to accept uh, and to learn about various patterns of extra gonadal tumor next slide So take home messages: It is a unique entity. It's got a biology and behavior is totally different from its gonadal counterparts, and diagnosis becomes challenging. Differential diagnosis is wide, as we've discussed. And uh, whenever we interpret anterior mediastinal masses, you have to see the correlation with age, uh, the rapidity of the symptoms, and thorough examination. Uh, when I say thorough examination, I would say that 
uh, if you suspecting that it is an extraconadal gct be sure it is extraconadal if you see something in the mediastinum and you think it is mediastinal gct always do a clinical examination of testis and do an ultrasound of testis to see that there is nothing occult that is lying in the gonads and uh, in the end i would say that apart from the staging and breast stratification uh, sperm banking we've already discussed hearing and echo are also very very important before we start treatment as all these chemotherapy are just starting I think for last case we can come. Uh, so I think, uh, ma'am, should we do the last case or should we skip it? Doctor Nita. Uh, Nita, ma'am, do you think we should do the last case or uh, wind up? I think, ma'am, the uh, audio is not connected. Yeah, hi. We can finish in five minutes. We'll take this up, Payal. Okay, ma'am. So uh, this is a 23-month-old female who had a gluteal mass and obstructive symptoms and constipation, difficulty in passing urine. She was very malnourished and irritable. Uh, next slide, please. Please, if somebody can move the slides quickly. Mm -hmm. So the mass was huge. It was eight by eight centimeter, and uh, uh, on PR it was almost bulging into the anal canal. An ultrasound was done for the same case, and uh, it showed a big uh, right gluteal mass, which was going up to the pararectal region. The child came to us, and we, um, uh, so Sajid sir, if you could tell us what what all do we see in an infant with a gluteal mass? What all should be not missed in such a patient? You've seen the clinical picture of the child. Right. Right. So, hello. Hello. Yes, so we can hear you. Important. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, uh. Perineal mass, gluteal mass, there are several uh, uh, differential diagnoses and not all lesion in the sacrococcygeal region is a germ cell tumor. That's uh, a, a rule. Uh, it Most commonly, it is a germ cell tumor, either a teratoma or a malignant germ cell tumor. But there are others, other lesion also predominantly. We see most commonly presacral or sacrococcygeal neuroblastoma, and we also see sacrococcygeal or presacral rhabdomyosarcoma. These are the other two, and the less common types in which includes the sacral tumors or uh, some hematogenous deposit, those are the things which uh, may be present. So these are the differential of sacrococcygeal uh, lesion uh, uh, primary. Next slide. Next slide, Shalyan. So, uh, uh, what next investigation could be done and what all information it gives them? If you could just quickly tell us. So, we would definitely like to do the imaging uh, and the tumor markers, and that will tell us a lot. We've already discussed, uh, all, so I'm not going to, into details uh, regarding organ of origin. So, I can show you that this, this child's MRI was showing this uh, tumor, heterogeneous tumor with variegated consistency, and there was a correlation with the tip of the coccyx. So uh, we did tumor markers, and AFP was grossly increased, and other two were normal. Uh, HCG and LDH was normal, and a diagnosis of sacrococcygeal germ cell tumor was made. We also did a CT chest as part of staging workup, and it revealed large nodules suggestive of uh, pulmonary meds. So uh, it was a high-risk stage for uh, 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 germ cell tumor. Uh, Dr. Sajid, could you please tell us the staging and risk stratification in case of sacrococcygeal uh, germ cell tumor? Uh, Dr. Shantanam, sorry. This is an extra gonadal germ cell tumor. So it has to be, uh, the staging is, uh, if it is uh, completely resected, if it is resected, but the margins are positive, and if it is not resected or only biopsy, or if it is metastatic. So these are the four stages of extra gonadal germ cell tumor, stage one, two, three, and four. And uh, if we are not contemplating surgery, it is stage three straight away. Right. Okay, next slide, please. I think this is pretty sorted. It is easy. And for risk stratification, 
uh, I think we already discussed that extra gonadal are generally not low risk. They are either intermediate or high risk. And this child was with pulmonary meds, so he was stage four high risk. Next slide, ma'am. So should we operate this child upfront or after a chemo, uh, Dr. Shalini? What do you say? So it, it's very important when we are operating on a sacrococcygeal uh, germ cell tumor that we should not have tumor spill. So we feel that we can easily remove the tumor without a spill, then definitely we can do an upfront surgery. But if if the tumor is large and there's late presentation, then most often we prefer to give a new adjuvant chemotherapies at least two cycles and then operate. Okay. So uh, we did the same. We gave three cycles of BP and definitely the child showed drastic decrease in the AFP. AFP became too clinically, the mass became very small and radiologically also there was a, uh, uh, quite a good response. You can see Dr. Shalini where she's pointing out uh, the tumor was big uh, in the first A image and in the B, the tumor can hardly be seen. The rectum can well be recognized if you can see, whereas in the previous image, the rectum cannot be seen. And the pulmonary meds also, it has almost disappeared. Next slide. So beautiful response after chemotherapy. So we went ahead after doing an excision of the sacral oxygen mass and it was a mixed blood cell tumor. Next slide, please. So uh, coxygectomy was done. So sir, uh, I think this is the most important part in sacral oxygen GCT uh, is how are they classified and what is its significance? Uh, it's the famous Ortman classification. Here in, uh, we have the different uh, types of uh, sacral oxygen depending on the relation, how much, come how, how or the component which is inside and outside, depending on the proportion of that, they are completely outside, some going inside, some predominantly inside and completely inside. So the importance of that is a, as the type increases from type one to type four, the incidence of malignancy also increases. And the surgical difficulties also increases with as the uh, 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 the Altman type in case. So that's the significance of uh, the Altman classification. Okay. Next slide. Next slide, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, to summarize, uh, the, the majority of sacral oxygen, they present in neonatal age and they're generally benign. Those presenting in older age, they've got higher incidence to have a malignant potential. Treatment is generally surgical excision, which is inclusive of a coxygectomy with additional chemotherapy for malignant tumors. Uh, in the end, uh, I want to thank um, uh, the organizers and I want to thank Dr. Sajid uh, for sparing his time and giving us detailed explanation, answering all the questions. Uh, Dr. Gauri Kapoor, uh, Dr. Shalini, and Dr. Sandeep Jain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I think most of the questions have been already taken up. I think there's one last question, I think, which I have not seen an answer, which is the most common cause of pelvic mass in a male child, GCT or rhabdomyosarcoma? <laughs> Sir, Sajid. Uh, it's a GCT. Sorry, sorry. I thought the question was for someone else. <laughs> yeah, so nobody didn't get the questions, sir. And... Uh, comprehensive as well all, all uh, different definitions have been covered and a lot of surgical discussion as well thank you to dr sajid and dr shalini for the wonderful discussion thank you gauri ma'am and your team for the discussion and um, and thanks to all the people who stayed back till the end thanks again bye thank you, thank you. bye bye